but I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Eric Miller, a professor in the Department of Civil and Mineral, Mineral Engineering at the University of Toronto, and I'm director of Mobility Network. Before introducing this session, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event sponsored by Mobility Network at the School of Cities. Mobility Network is an institutional strategic initiative at the University of Toronto. U of T's institutional strategic initiatives address humanity's greatest challenges. Great challenge, grand challenges demand a cross-disciplinary and collaborative approach between university researchers and their partners in government, industry, and the public. In, mobility's networks, in Mobility Network's case, our starting point is the recognition that the sustainable, equitable, and efficient movement of people and goods is a regional, national, and global challenge. Our mission is to harness the incredible depth and breadth of UOT's researchers to induce transformational changes in mobility services, usage, and impacts to affect significant positive societal change. We believe that UOT has a primary role to play in, first, understanding the complexity of the systemic and cross-cutting mobility challenges facing us, and then translating this understanding into positive and innovative change. You may know us from past collaborations or events from UTRI, the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute. Mobility Network intends to take these activities up several notches. We have assembled a group of 60 researchers from across U of T's three campuses whose diverse interests span the broad scope of critical issues about mobility and who will collectively advance the mobility network agenda. As you know, transportation touches virtually all aspects of our lives. We have named this panel session The Way Forward since it, since it is the starting point of the journey in which we hope we will join Mobility Network as we explore paths towards sustainable and equitable, equitable mobility. Each session of The Way Forward is designed to address one of the factors critical to this journey. This afternoon, our topic for discussion is titled Harnessing Intelligence in Transportation Systems. And with this very brief introduction, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to our panel moderator, Professor Florian Schurti, sorry, I'm mangling your name, Florian, from the Department of Computer Science and is a member of our Cognate ISI Robotics Institute. Over to you, Florian. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, I am Florian Schurti. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Math and Computational Sciences at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Uh, my own research interests are in robotics, machine learning and computer vision. So I'm delighted to be the moderator of today's panel uh, titled Harnessing Intelligence in Transportation Systems. Uh, I also wanted to begin by providing some more context and uh, mentioning Ontario's growth plan, which promotes the development of uh, complete communities. These are communities where people can live, work, shop, and access services in close proximity uh, through a mix of housing types, diversity and land uses, um, street connectivity and transportation options. Uh, so the City of Toronto's uh, official plan review has a policy focus on neighborhoods and complete communities and what is needed to make them thriving. Today, our panelists are going to talk and focus on the future of intelligent transportation systems that will contribute to this broader vision. Um, each of the uh, panelists will take a few minutes to share remarks and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion and we'll open it uh, up to questions from the audience. So please post your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll introduce each of the pa panelists in their turn, beginning with uh, Bahar. Bahar Abdullahi is a professor in the uh, Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering and the director of the Toronto Intelligent Transporta Transportation System Center. Uh, his research interests are in the application of emerging technologies to traffic management. Uh, Bahar is going to get us started by explaining how imbalances between the demand for travel and the supply of transportation infrastructure lead to congestion uh, and he will talk about the promise of intelligent transportation systems to address this imbalance. So thank you, uh, thank so the floor is yours, Bahar. All right, thank you, Florian. Um, I'll, uh, in a few minutes, I'd like to uh, talk about managing congestion in real time with intelligent transportation systems. Without preaching to the experts here, you know that we live in a, uh, a metropolis, a big city, cities all over the world are growing rapidly for a number of good reasons. But one of the challenges that come with that is congestion, which, which is becoming a household pain that we discuss every day at the dinner table. 
So why is it happening? Um, like categorically speaking and in simple words, this congestion occurs when the ratio of demand, that is the number of trips uh, relative to the supply, that is the road capacity approaches and exceeds one. So simply it does not fit. More, uh, even worse than that is that we have the so-called capacity loss where when you try to insert more and more vehicles on the road, once you get to capacity, boom, the capacity itself collapses and you lose significant uh, uh, time. So what do we do? Um, well, again, in simple terms, you have to expand since it's ratio of demand to capacity, you have to expand the capacity by uh, building more infrastructure. It's prohibitively expensive and slow to come. And some choices are better than others, but nevertheless, it's inevitable. Another solution is to reduce the demand. Again, demand over supply. So we want to reduce the demand. And a third solution is to use intelligence and use technology to um, manage both demand and supply and manage uh, their interactions. So one concept here that's kind of hard to explain to people is the concept of what I call pacing beats rushing. And this little video demonstration here, the gentleman in the video is showing that uh, he's put pouring rice in a funnel, which is similar to traffic on a freeway. And you see when everybody's dumped into the funnel, it gets stuck and nobody moves. Uh, and this is the congestion that we encounter every day. While if we repeat the same experiment, but as the lady in the video pours uh, traffic, that is the rice, slowly into the funnel, what happens as um, traffic is stuck on the right road, on the left road, traffic is passing through beautifully. Not only this, it, it, it arrives in less time, but actually you can do it again and again and again. The point here is that um, you, if you pace demand into the infrastructure, then uh, 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 it travels faster. And it's kind of hard to explain to people, slow down to arrive faster. And this video is a thousand words. So uh, one of the things we do is uh, utilizing artificial intelligence, which is pretty much imagine a traffic light where we put eyes on it and we put a brain on it and it sees traffic with computer vision or LIDAR um, or, or even connected vehicles and then thinks on its own to minimize uh, delays. We tested this in simulation over um, uh, downtown Toronto and we found out on average, we can save about 30, 8% uh, of delay at the intersection. That doesn't mean 38% of the car will evaporate, but it means that if you're stopping for a minute, maybe it will be 40 seconds instead of a minute at each traffic light. So you pass through 20 lights, then you save quite a bit of time. We also control uh, freeways in a similar way. The top freeway here is the status quo that is not controlled, while the middle one is controlled with a brain to uh, uh, Pace traffic in from the ramp using ramp metering, and you see the freeway with the same demand is flowing without a problem. While in the bottom part, we give priority to the on ramp and um, um, uh, slow down the freeway a, a little bit, but the end result combined, we can save up to 50% uh, of delays. That's on the supply side. On the demand side, we have to pace the demand, as I mentioned, and one method to pace the demand is through uh, time dependent pricing. So in this curve here, if you see my cursor, that is uh, speeds uh, or travel times on the Gardner uh, in the morning. And you see that there is traffic peaks at certain amount of time. And then we meet that with pricing uh, that is similar, mimics the same structure of congestion, again, to make people change their departure time and their routing in a manner that does not overwhelm the infrastructure. Another uh, approach is through You're um, about reservations. You're about to hit the road, drive, or use this. transit. But wait, do you have a reservation? Like flying anywhere, you need a reservation to book a spot. This guarantees the system is not chaotic or oversubscribed. So why are roads and transit systems not the same? University of Toronto's researchers are creating an intelligent transportation system application to do just that. Manage trips in a transportation system with the reservation software to mitigate congestion, reduce delays, protect the environment, and enhance traveler experience. Traffic congestions are soaring with urbanization growth, yet the transportation infrastructure is not coping at the same pace due to obvious financial, land, and environmental constraints. 
And when major happenings occur, like the COVID-19 pandemic, capacities are constrained even further to ensure physical distancing and safe travel. Not only does the demand overpower infrastructure capacity, but congestions further degrade capacities due to turbulence at the time it is needed most. To solve this problem, a team of UFT researchers are developing TRIP, a trip reservation and intelligent planning system designed to flatten the congestion curve and prevent hypercongestion. Well, I'll leave it at that and then we can discuss it later on. Now the discussion wouldn't be complete if we don't touch on automated uh, driving and um, uh, shared mobility. These technologies are coming at us very fast and we uh, adopt them or tend to adopt them without thinking it through properly. But obviously the fear here is that that would create dependency on the car further and repeat the story of the car, meaning congestion without bounds and this time um, on steroids. So we know that the, the new technology uh, is intended to empower mobility choices, improve congestion and reduce accidents, reduce emissions, reduce parking requirement and free road space and free time. However, we have to be mindful that Potentially, the same technologies can increase in vehicle kilometers traveled, increase sprawl, reduce capacities of the roads, and um, uh, uh, have se severe accidents when they happen, and then all kinds of conflicts between robots and pedestrians, uh, which might require separate infrastructure and, of course, new regulations to handle all of this. So with that, to close, um, we have to think our way through better this time and not repeat the mistakes of the car. Uh, and we want to make sure that demand fits in the uh, supply capacity in order to ensure uh, uh, triple bottom line sustainability, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Bahar. Uh, that was a that was a that was a very thought provoking talk. Uh, so next up is uh, Amr. If you would please turn on your camera. Uh, Amr Shalabi is a professor in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering and the director of the Transit Analytics Lab. Um, his work intends to help transportation authorities to respond more effectively to unexpected crises within a network. Uh, he will turn our attention to how intelligent transportation systems can improve the performance of the fixed route, fixed schedule transit systems we, we have currently, and how new transit services like on-demand transit can be integrated into those uh, networks. So the floor is, your, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Amr. Thank you, Florian. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, shift focus now on public transit, as uh, Florian mentioned. And uh, actually, one of the effective ways uh, to combat congestion that Beher talked about is to induce mode shift to con convince more people to leave their cars at home and take public transit. But obviously, public transit, as many of us uh, already know, uh, suffers really from a number of challenges. You know, if you ask uh, a bunch of people, you know, uh, to talk about, you know, their transit experience, they will talk about, you know, how transit is too slow. And actually, this is supported by um, empirical evidence, you know, average speed on many routes is 12 kilometers per hour. Um, public transit is also unreliable. So buses don't follow schedule. Sometimes they come early, sometimes they come late, sometimes they come in a bunch. Um, and uh, missed connections and so on and so forth. So reliability is a big issue. Also public transit for many people is too far to access and um, also infrequent. So public transit, uh, especially in outlying areas and, and off peak times uh, has really poor coverage. And uh, also to the operator, public transit is co costly um, because of driver wage and fuel consumption and so on. Um, of course, you know, all of us really have a lot of solutions to this and um, uh, there are actually solutions that are at the strategic level, you know, at the network level, so you can redesign the network such that you improve the efficiency of the transit network, you can redesign the routes, for example, you um, consolidate some stops, you shift some uh, bus stops and so on, so that you can speed up the transit operation. You can introduce some uh, intersection design uh, elements, um, uh, street design like queue jump lanes, boarding islands, and, and so on and so forth, or, or exclusive bus lanes. There are also actions that you can do in real time. So real time route management, uh, like if a bus is coming a little bit early, you can actually hold the bus at the stop for 
a couple more minutes or something. Or if the bus is coming a bit uh, late, you can actually express the bus or uh, expedite its operation. Um, if, if there's bunching, you can perhaps short turn the route. And then we have uh, a lot of new technologies can support that. Um, and in fact, there is a lot of potential to harness and leverage new technologies like uh, GPS on buses and also automatic passenger counters that count people getting on and off the bus and also connected and automated vehicles. Uh, those are all technologies that we can harness them and the data that really they provide coupled with uh, advanced AI methods to undertake and automate some of the real-time route management strategies more intelligently and uh, more efficiently. So I want to actually just touch upon uh, one of the most popular and cost-effective uh, smart route strategy, which is TSP uh, transit signal priority. Uh, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Uh, it's a technology whereby a bus, when it's detected approaching an intersection, uh, the signal gives priority to the bus. So if the traffic light is green, it extends the green until the bus clears the intersection. If the traffic light is red, it cuts short the red and brings the next green a little bit earlier. Uh, most of the uh, implemented systems rely on very simple logic. Uh, they are not really adaptive to a, a wide range of situations, especially new situations. <clears throat> so those systems are actually pretty good to reduce signal delay. In other words, they can speed up the bus, but they do not necessarily improve reliability. So uh, another advancement in the area of uh, uh, TSP is so-called adaptive TSP, whereby you actually try to build more intelligent logic using AI to optimize both speed as well as reliability. So if a bus is coming a little bit uh, early or too close to the previous bus, you don't need actually to uh, give it priority. In fact, you want to delay that bus a little bit. So you want actually to determine how much exactly you want to delay that bus. So uh, at U of T, we've built some algorithms using reinforcement learning to try to uh, achieve that objective of improving both speed and reliability. Uh, but this is actually, we found that this has limited potential if we do not really coordinate the actions at successive intersections. If you want to resolve a reliability issue, if you have a bunched, uh, two, two buses that are bunched up, you cannot really solve this at a single intersection. You need to solve this over multiple intersections through a, a series of coordinated actions. Um, so we also, this is so-called coordinated and adaptive TSP. So those are all advanced versions of uh, the conventional TSP that both rely really on uh, communication technology, as well as AI methods. Um, we actually found in simulations that, you know, those coordinated and adaptive TSP are pretty effective, but uh, under uh, low to moderate traffic conditions, when traffic conditions are, or traffic volumes are very high, uh, those systems uh, do not very, work very well. So you need to actually supplement that with additional strategies. So one up and coming strategy is so-called dynamic transit lanes. And those are temporary bus lanes that you provide priority to the bus as it approaches a particular section. And this would be implemented either using fixed electronic signs like overhead signs or curbside signs to notify drivers that, hey, clear the curb lane because a bus is approaching. Uh, or it could be also be implemented using uh, vehicle to vehicle communication. So the bus would be sending a message to all downstream vehicles that, you know, please clear uh, the curb lane because I'm approaching this, uh, this section, uh, very much like really emergency vehicles blowing their sirens. Um, so this is something we're also working with to, or trying to develop using AI methods to work with TSP to improve its performance. Um, and uh, in addition, also we're looking at speed and holding advisories as well. Um, looking to the future, on-demand transit uh, is uh, coming back. So in fact, many of us are familiar with the so dial a ride service, which used to be quite uh, uh, popular uh, in, in like a few decades ago, uh, but now you, the modern version of it using apps and using advanced routing um, algorithms is really coming back. And this is uh, a solution that can address the coverage the poor coverage problem of, of public transit and so-called first mile, last mile problem. Um, there are so many pilots that have been rolled out in many cities uh, in Canada and elsewhere. 
Uh, but unfortunately, those are time restricted pilots, you know, six month pilot or nine months pilot. Um, so there's really no guidance for transit planners to integrate those services uh, seamlessly and permanently into the overall network. Uh, so um, ongoing work now is really to develop guidelines to help transit planners um, integrate those services within the overall transit network. So that's it for me and thank you. Over to you, Florian. All right, perfect. Thank you, Amr. Uh... I'll have more questions about the uh, uh, algorithmic nature of uh, of your work later on. Uh, next up is uh, Birsen. Uh, if you if you please turn on your camera. Uh, so uh, Birsen Dornmez is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering at the University of Toronto and the director of the Human Factors and Applied Statistics Lab. Uh, Birsen studies human adaptation to technology and increasingly her interest in uh, driver distractions. Uh, has taken her along the path of studying how human operators will interact with driverless uh, vehicles. Uh, today, Birsen is going to talk about how the interaction between humans and uh, uh, intelligent algorithms, uh, how that uh, interaction is going to, going to take place, and she will help us understand what humans can and cannot do in vigilant mode. Over to you, Birsen. Hey, thank you very much, Florian, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as uh, stated by Florian, um, I do focus on the human elements in engineering design. And in order to ensure that intelligent systems and also unintelligent systems or not so intelligent systems work well, we have to consider the human elements in, in design. And this is not a trivial problem, especially for intelligent systems that may behave in ways that are potentially unpredictable. Uh, to the human operators. So my specialty is called human factors engineering for those of you who are not familiar with it. It is the approach to designing systems that leverage the capabilities of humans, but at the same time compensating for their limitations um, so that the systems that we design are safe, productive, and satisfying to the human user. <clears throat> and as stated by Florian, my research mainly focuses on road user behavior and exceedingly on road user interactions with driving automation. So the, I'm going to make two general points uh, in these remarks, the high level remarks, and they will relate to driving automation in particular. So the, my first point is uh, humans have a number of uh, physiological limitations. And I think being humans, we do realize that we have these. Although we are also pretty amazing, right? We are trying to replicate certain human abilities um, in engineering design, and we are really hitting um, roadblocks in trying to do that in things like pattern recognition or decision-making high-level cognition. Um, so systems that take a human-centered approach in their design consider these limitations. And they tend to fare better in terms of safety benefits in transportation applications than those systems that are being implemented for the sake of advancement of technology. I think we're also seeing those on our roads currently. So one example that I'm going to give is um, SAE level two automation. For those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, this is actually type of driving automation that we currently see on our roads where the automation takes both the lateral and the longitudinal vehicle control, but is far from perfect and therefore requires the human driver to monitor the road and the automation at all times and step in uh, when it fails. So basically what these systems are doing is taking the human operator from active vehicle control and making them monitors of the system and assigning them a vigilance task, basically a sustained attention task. And we know from basically research from World War II, so this has been long known that humans are bad at monitoring things when they're not actively taking part in the task. Um, and uh, the type of research that basically informed in World War II, uh, this type of understanding was on sonar operators where their performance significantly declined after a certain period of time, around 20 minutes or so. 
So, um, you know, what, then why are we implementing these systems if we do know that the, the human's task maybe puts them in a, um, in a less than optimal situation um, to, to kind of sustain safety. Humans, of course, have other attentional limitations. For example, uh, we humans may fail to detect potential hazards because our attention is allocated somewhere else. And systems that try to address this limitation are actually very successful. In 2020, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety released its findings for forward collision warning systems. Trucks equipped with this system had 22% fewer collisions. And autonomous emergency braking system, so in addition to the warning where the system actually steps in for you and brakes, the reduction was actually 12%. And back in 2016, the same institute released a report for Volvo City Safety System and reported significant decrease for rear end crashes. So when you look at the SAE Society of Automotive Engineers taxonomy, these systems would fall under level zero automation, although I would argue they're still automation because they're automating certain um, human tasks. Yet uh, it appears that you know, they're lower in the taxonomy and they shouldn't be as advanced and they shouldn't be maybe as useful, but that's really far from, from the truth. So the second point that I want to make is that humans also have agency to make decisions and choose whether to use a system or not, or to use it properly. But they may also fail to use a system properly because they don't know how to. So it may not be an intentional uh, or a conscious decision to use a system improperly. Uh, you may have seen reports of drivers finding workarounds for level two driving automation that requires constant monitoring. The example that I'm gonna give is the Tesla autopilot system, uh, which used to rely on hands-on wheel uh, sensors to detect that the driver is being engaged in the monitoring task. Uh, so if the driver's hands are off the wheel for a couple of seconds, then the Tesla would actually give a warning to the driver saying, well, you're not paying attention. But uh, it turns out that you can fool these sensors very easily. And there were reports of people sticking an orange on the steering wheel, um, making the car think that their hands were on the wheel. So that, that is a really improper use of the, of the system. So why would someone do something so dangerous when we know that these systems have a lot of limitations? There may be various social psychological reasons for it, which I don't have time to discuss here. In my group, we identified one potential reason for inappropriate reliance on level two systems that drivers actually do not know the majority of the limitations of the systems that they have in their vehicles. So, uh, you know, the, the more complex these systems are, uh, the harder it can be for the human operator to really understand what the capabilities or the limitations of these systems are. Um, so aside from individual factors, of course, culture can also play a role in how people use technology. And I'm going to relate back to Amar's point about dynamic transit lanes. Um, I haven't uh, experienced it for, for a bus, but I have experienced it for an emergency vehicle. Um, what, as I was attending a conference in Germany, and we rented a, a, a kind of a higher end vehicle and we were driving on the highway. And all of a sudden, um, you know, we were kind of approaching traffic and our navigation display basically introduced a graphical user interface um, telling us to clear a middle lane that we were driving on. And, uh, and we did because there was an emergency vehicle basically approaching and apparently there was a crash ahead of us. And it worked so seamlessly, right? Um, and that, that was very, very surprising. But uh, at the time, it happened so fast, it was an emergency situation. I couldn't take a picture. So I was searching for pictures on Google. I couldn't find one, unfortunately. But I, I wondered how it may fare in a different country. Um, and uh, given that not everyone has access to these uh, emerging technologies, right? We kind of had the ability to, uh, to get this on an in-vehicle display, but not everyone's vehicle is, is going to have these, have these things. So I'm going to stop that, uh, stop there and, uh, hand it back to Florian. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you, Kirsten. 
Uh, so now at this point, uh, I'll invite Amar and uh, Bahir to, um, uh, to the panel so that we can start a, a discussion about some of the uh, points that were raised during by the individual uh, panelists. Uh, so maybe we can start with, um, you know, with the data that we need in order to create some of these intelligent transportation uh, systems. So what type of data do you think we will need in order to either track how well these systems are performing or to improve them in the in the near future. Uh, uh, Amr, do you want to go first? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I talked about uh, transit signal priority. So obviously uh, a very important piece of data is really knowing the location of the bus. And uh, there have been different detection technologies. Uh, the more common one now is really GPS. But if you want to design more intelligent algorithms for to give priority to transit, you need also to have information and data about the surrounding environment. You know how many cars, for example, that are uh, at the intersection queued up in each lane. How many persons are on on the bus? Uh, how many passengers on, on on the bus, and so on. So uh, and you know for each type of information, you need different uh, kind of sensor or technology to give you this data in real time. Um, so yeah, now we try to uh, rely more on sensor data like GPS, APC, automatic passenger counters, as well as you know traffic signal timing to be provided in real time, as well as uh, traffic sensors as well too. Bahir and uh, Birsen, what type of data would uh, you like to see? Yeah, I don't want to repeat what Amr said, but in general, we, there are some important static da data, such as where people live, where they work, how do they get to work, what their mode preferences are, socioeconomic characteristics. So that gives us an idea about the travel patterns, the, the typical travel patterns. But also in real time, we want to know specifically where people are. Like imagine using a Google map. Google map wouldn't be a Google map if uh, Google doesn't know second by second, how you're progressing through your trip. So this is this is uh, uh, an example of dynamic real-time data that we need to gather. Uh, we also need system data as, for instance, where congestion is. So for Google to tell you, don't take this road, take that road, they need to know how the infrastructure is, is like at a, a given point in time. Um, I can also add, uh, maybe more uh, from the driving automation perspective, but um, again, real-time data about the behavior of the road users would be very important uh, if you're introducing automated systems um, so that the, that system can uh, act appropriately, uh, understanding the in intention of the human. So the example that I gave with Tesla using hands-on wheel um, type of information for driver engagement assessment falls short. Uh, there, there is a need to, uh, to build basically more informative driver or generally road user state uh, detection algorithms uh, to ensure that these systems then work properly. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so we're, we're sort of talking about some level of uh, centralized sort of uh, decision-making and some level of decentralized and individual car or individual passenger decision making. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering, um, towards the end of the spectrum where you have centralized decision making, so that in order to avoid congestion or in order to slow some people down in order to allow traffic to flow through, uh, are the cost functions for that decision for those decision making systems, are they well understood or are they still you know, topics of research. Uh, so do we know well how to balance these multiple objectives and how to disappoint some people, you know, some of the time, but not, you know, all people all of the time? Uh, you know, do we, do we have any, uh, are there any things that are still unclear from a research standpoint uh, for those trade-offs? That's a million dollar question. Maybe I'll uh, try to warm up the discussion here. Sure. Um, so take the trip reservation system that we, we researched as, a, as an example. Um, if um, we make access to the infrastructure limited, like you cannot, if you have an airplane, you cannot just fly. You have to 
make res prior reservation and be assigned a route and so on. So if we apply the same concept to cars, then who's going to reserve first? And what happens to those who don't reserve until last minute and potentially can be denied a trip? So how people will react to that is uh, a bit unknown. But the hope here is that if, for instance, um, we fill up 80% of the infrastructure and now it's at capacity, we cannot take any more then the rest of the 20%, this is where we would hope to convert them to transit or other times uh, of the day. And then we need to understand how they respond to those constraints. Like what people say, heck, no, I'm going to drive no matter what. Give me a ticket if you want. Or they will actually uh, comply with the system. The example that Berson mentioned in Germany, you just clear the middle lane, everybody uh, uh, moves out. What we have, what do we have this here? That is uh, obviously the behavior part of it is unknown. Yeah, I, I might, yeah, I might add. Um, <clears throat> so as as we try to develop more sophisticated and cooperative, really systems that try to coordinate actions at different parts of the system. Uh, for example, the example I give about coordinated TSP where you want to, co to coordinate the priority actions at multiple intersections. Um, so a system like this would actually need to be centralized control as opposed to decentralized. So TSP has been implemented in both uh, modes, uh, but to, uh, to, to, to implement those advanced systems, you need a little bit more centralization so that you can coordinate the actions more efficiently and effectively. Of course, it comes at a cost and comes uh, with some complexity as well in terms of implementation. Um, so there are obviously uh, trade-offs. Um, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Uh, and Birson? Nothing to add. Okay. Uh, so we we talk quite a bit about um you know assessing the safety of some of these uh systems um and there are multiple ways to to measure safety so maybe Birson, we can start with you and talk about driver assist systems how would you what what are your thoughts on um you know what's wrong or what can be improved in terms of evaluating the safety of these systems in uh in current environments yeah, I think they've been in development for, a, I'd say, a number of decades now, right? As, uh, starting from research ideas, uh, evaluation and driving simulators with, uh, with actual humans to see how humans may react to these systems, um, and then taking it uh, to the field and through field operational tests that are generally funded by governments to see how these systems fare before they do uh, get the approval for large-scale implementation. So uh, unfortunately, we don't see that with uh, some of the emerging um, automation systems. And, uh, you know, we as the public become test subjects, uh, maybe uh, unwillingly or unknowingly. Um, <laughs> so that, uh, I think that there needs to be more, more regulation and, and there will be more regulation coming Oh, for sure, I know that that's happening in the States. Um, and uh, I, I do assume other countries uh, would follow suit as well. It, it would be great if the public could be paid for some of the risk that they're incurring while these vehicles are being tested. Yeah, uh, it's important coffee, coffee cart would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could raise the price a bit. Uh, but here, how about you? What do you think? Uh, well, it's not my my space really, but uh, what I, I second what Burson said. And uh, Amr, do you have anything to add? Uh, not really, not much to add on the safety side. Got it. So um, we, so I guess staying a bit on the topic of driver assistance uh, systems, um, what do you think uh, they are currently doing well, and what do you think they should be try they should try to improve over the next let's say decade yeah. maybe birsen we can start with yeah, you again. maybe I can, I can take that i i did mention um road user state detection uh, systems uh there's actually quite a bit of push for um implementing driver state monitoring systems uh which 
would make these driver assist systems even smarter, right? So um, they would, uh, they can understand whether, for example, the driver intends to react in a situation and, you know, delay response, mm -hmm. or they may, if, for example, they detect that the driver is inattentive, then they may respond faster than they normally would. Um, and there is a, there is a push. Um, European Union is, is going to require very soon that there's going to be some sort of a, a driver state monitoring system implemented in new vehicles. Uh, we don't know in what form they're going to come, uh, but uh, again, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of research on vision-based camera-based systems to kind of identify whether the driver is attentive or, or fatigued. So these are you know, inattention and fatigue are two states that we know are, um, are dangerous. Um, so I think that's that's where things are going to start. But uh, it can definitely help current uh, driving paradigm, manually driven vehicles, but also as you are introducing these higher levels of vehicle automation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, do you see that sipping into driver education as well? Uh, so now that we have more footage of some of these, uh, you know, bad examples of driving, for example, do you see that, you know, do you see a feedback loop between how people learned how to drive? Yeah, potentially. We have actually done some research looking at providing almost like a report card to teenage drivers several years ago. And it does have uh, basically potential benefits to kind of show people, you know, when they were attentive or when they were not attentive um, <laughs> to change behavior. But it was limited. It was, it was for my PhD. You know, it was over three days people came in. So I don't know how it would pan out, right, let's say, for a year of use. Got it. Uh, and Bahir and uh, Amer, I, I know it's not your uh, topic of research, but uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's actually related uh, to congestion, which is my area. Um, uh, how, how do you help congestion with those uh, driver assist systems? Uh, congestion, one thing we want to vehicle, vehicles to drive closer to each other, uh, better than humans. You want to make them uh, superhuman. If they are subhuman, meaning leaving a lot of space in front of them, then they will have adverse effect on congestion. So to make them drive like in close, uh, compact form, uh, there is car following and car following technologies are advancing, advancing uh, rapidly and some of them are already implemented on the road. So I see this as a, a good example. Um, uh, another one is emergency stopping, like we lose attention as Berson mentioned. And if the computer is sensing that you're not reacting fast enough and it starts beeping or actually breaking the car, that helps congestion a lot. What I don't see evolving as well as I hope to is lateral control, like lane changing and uh, merging and diverging. Uh, it's a complex maneuver, and I, I don't think AVs are there yet. We, we see, for instance, videos of um, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, approaching from the own ramp, and they go in the acceleration lane to reach the end of the acceleration lane and stop because they couldn't take that merge uh, maneuver, and it's just like they stop thinking or, or freeze. So a, a bit of work is still needed in that space. Um, I also wanted to add uh, that there's a lot of potential for those driver assist technologies for uh, buses. Um, so there has actually been uh, a concerted effort to uh, introduce and test some of those technologies like collision avoidance, um, steering assistance, uh, lane guidance, and so on uh, to buses. And um, there have been some pilots, uh, especially in the United States, uh, because, you know, driving buses is a very uh, a stressful task. Uh, there's been reported uh, uh, research really that shows uh, how stressful, you know, the driving task for, for bus drivers, you know, just dealing with the public as well as, you know, the stop and go, uh, the, the, you know, stop and go operation of buses and so on. So driver assist technologies really can uh, uh, help with, with this. And, um, so, for example, in Minnesota, there has been a bus only uh, a shoulder, like buses operating on shoulder of a highway using lane guidance technology. Um, there's also so-called precision docking 
uh, for buses to really dock at the platforms exactly lined up with the platform. So again, those are all driver assist uh, technologies that can help uh, bus operation to uh, undertake some tasks that would be hard otherwise to do uh, manually. Great, that's that's wonderful. So I want to open up the uh, Q&A to, to the audience as well. Uh, and uh, there are already some very, very nice questions in the chat. So let me uh, ask one of them. Um, so this is from uh, Mike, Mike V. Uh, as uh, uh, he asks, as differently abled persons will tell you, uh, dial a ride transit services um, here presented as a solution to adding service to poorly serviced uh, areas, they can be very unreliable. So the question is, what will tech do to make a dial a ride service reliable and efficient? It's a good uh, question. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned in my, in my brief uh, uh, opening remarks that uh, there have been a number of pilots uh, and there's actually a number of uh, vendors now that provide the technologies to support on-demand transit, so for routing and so on. Uh, so the technology is evolving. The, uh, the algorithms are actually improving to route vehicles to for pickups and drop-offs and minimizing uh, waiting time and so on. But of course, it's a very complex really design problem. You need to decide on really the size of the zone within which uh, on-demand transit will be operating and you know how many buses and the size of each bus, whether actually it's you know small vehicles or big vehicles. So it is, uh, there's a lot of design uh, questions and elements. And that's something what we are trying to uh, provide guidance for, to help transit agencies uh, you know, customize an efficient on-demand transit operation given the conditions and circumstances of a given area. Uh, any other thoughts from the uh, panelists about this question? Uh, I guess a follow-up question would be, um, you know, if I if I order an Uber, I know within a minute or so when it is going to arrive, uh, and I can see it on the app. The app is great; it's fine. Uh, but uh, for something like the TTC service for, uh, you know, differently abled uh, people or people with mobility issues, and I have people like that in my family, uh, they give you a, a, a time of, you know, two hours uh, yeah. where they can, you know, you never, you don't know when, uh, when it's going to arrive. So is that just a matter of volume uh, and availability of some of these vehicles uh, or is it, you know, some more fundamental problem? Well, accessible transportation, uh, or sometimes is referred to as paratransit, is uh, fundamentally different uh, from on-demand transit. Um, it has some requirements with respect to the vehicle and also uh, operator, uh, someone to help uh, you know passengers and so on. So it is um, a, a rather different. There have been some attempts really to try to um, combine those services in uh, like both paratransit as well as on-demand transit. Um, but it, it's a fairly complex, uh, really, challenge. Um, uh, so those two, they have some similarities, but they are not identical, those two uh, services. Got it. Um, so Brendan Hamilly is asking, um, uh, so uh, asking about centralized control for managing multiple objectives uh, through V2X. Uh, how would this be managed institutionally across a region? Right now, yeah. every operator uh, is, in its own, is in their own uh, silo. How do we even move forward at an institutional uh, level yeah. about coordinated planning? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. And uh, yeah, in a big region where you have multiple operators and those operators might actually have different uh, systems. Um, so uh, when it comes to TSP, for example, um, there have been some standards being developed now so that uh, it can facilitate interoperability between different operators if they are, uh, if they are all following the same uh, specifications and standards. Um, so this is one way of uh, trying to um, uh, address this challenge uh, of managing institutionally um, like at the regional level, uh, uh, multiple operations or multiple operators that are, um, uh, so you're not really captive to a specific vendor and with their own specifications, but you know, all vendors now really have to follow specifications that will facilitate and, and allow for this interoperability 
So if a bus, for example, TTC is operating for in, um, in New York region, uh, you know, just serving a stop in New York region uh, and uh, traveling through an intersection, it can receive the transit signal priority if it's following um, the, uh, the specifications of stopping mode. Got it. Uh, any thoughts from uh, Bahir or Birsen? Well, the same issue, um, multi-agency collaboration also exists in traffic. Like for ages, freeways and, and surface streets have been dealt with as separate animals. Like freeways are, are provincial while surface streets are typically municipal. While for someone who's driving, it's seamless. You get off the freeway, you get onto the surface street and so on. But the, what has been trending uh, over the past couple of decades or so is the so-called center-to-center integration of communication, where freeway management centers, for instance, would be connected to um, a municipal traffic management centers and see each other and, and uh, uh, see their own their joint information. So a lot more can be done to make it seamless. For example, um, coordinate what a traffic light does if it is intelligent to what a ramp controller does, if both, for instance, are using AI and, and uh, some form of smart communication, then technology here can step in to enhance the collaboration between the different entities that control the same system. Got it. Uh, so one more question regarding privacy from uh, Lawrence Franklin. Uh, they're asking, monitoring traffic, flow, uh, traffic flows and volume can be anonymous data. However, monitoring driver states is very personal. So who will have access to that data? It's a great question. It is a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I do assume, I, I mean, uh, you, what the EU is introducing isn't to collect and store that data, um, but uh, in real time for the vehicle to, to basically utilize that data um, to, enhanced driver assistance, right? But that is not to say that the, the car companies wouldn't necessarily record that data and use it for other purposes. Um, and, you know, it tends to happen with really all aspects of our lives um, at this uh, time period where, you know, I'm using a Google phone and it's, uh, it's collecting all sorts of data from me, unfortunately. Yeah. Just uh, automat automatically signing the terms and conditions. That's Just right. uh, surrendering, yes. But it's um, a very valid concern. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, one of the ways in which the machine learning community is trying to address this is this concept of differential privacy, where even if you had you know, the, you know, the data set, you cannot, probabilistically, you cannot infer uh, who the individual is from, from the you know, features of the data set that you know. So that people are looking at this question from an algorithmic perspective as well, but it has multiple layers. Um, just the al algorithmic aspect is not going to solve it. Um, I, I think one one uh, issue that came up but we didn't discuss very much is simulation. So I'm wondering, what do people think is the role of simulation uh, in some of these intelligent uh, systems? Oh, it's uh, huge, actually. For one. Um, we can break things in simulation many times, um, but we cannot do in, in real life. So if we are in the process of designing a system or uh, training an AI system, how to control a traffic light and so on, we're not gonna put it in the field naively and you know, uh, have it make mistakes. So we have to work in simulations hundreds, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of times before it's actually um, uh, ready, ready for deployment. Yeah, I agree with Beher. I mean, uh, most of the AI agents or methods that we develop really are, get trained in, uh, in a simulation environment and uh, evaluated there and before, obviously, uh, they can be deployed in, uh, in the real world. So simulation really plays a huge role. And it's actually growing even further. Now there, there's a concept emerging. Uh, it's a bit buzzwordy known as digital twin, where if you have if you have the real system, the real traffic system, for instance, how to have a simulation running in parallel, but driven by real data. So it's actually as a replica of what's actually happening on the road. And the hope here is that, let's say, for instance, there's an accident and we want to explore how to deal with it. 
then you revert to the digital twin and try 20 different strategies and then pick the best one. It's challenging though, because it's not just static simulation, but it, it has to be running in real time and ready for, for action when you need it. Um, I can also add uh, from the, the human response perspective, we actually do a lot of research in driving sim simulators uh, because it does uh, give us the ability to create controlled and repeatable conditions where we can test a system that doesn't yet exist in the real world and redesign it and test it again and collect data uh, without actual physical risk to, to the drivers. So we may be able to create you know, cra crash level conflict situations and then see how a driver may respond um, to the system. Very useful. Great, that's that's wonderful. So I think uh, it's time for me to land the plane or park the truck or park the bus or whatever. Uh, and I'll pass it over to, to, to Judy. And thank you, Florian. And I'm Judy Farvolden, the Executive Director of Mobility Network. And, and I get to say thanks. I get to say thanks to the panelists for a great conversation, to Florian, thank you for moderating, and to all of you for joining us. Thanks, thanks ever so much, right? Um, if you wanna know more about U of T research and intelligent transportation systems, why don't you join us for Trans Transformative Transportation 22, which is next Tuesday. It's online and it's free, but you have to register. You can find out more about it um, on the UTree website under events. And Pat has put a link to the registration page in the chat. So that's next Tuesday. If today got you going on intelligent transportation systems, you wanna learn more, um, they'll go into a much deeper dive on how they do it, why they do it, and what they find out as they're studying trans uh, intelligent transportation systems. So this is, whoopsie, up, up. This is the last, ah, I'm out of here. This is the last in a series of seven sessions exploring the way forward. We'll be back in the fall. Um, how will you know that we're gonna be back in the fall? Um, you'll get your reminders if you subscribe to our newsletter. Mm -hmm. So we invite you please to subscribe to our newsletter and you can do that on the YouTube website. Um, and you can always find out more by contacting us. Um, so uh, we hope to see you again in the fall. Um, I hope that when we return after the summer and come in, and do another one of these series, they'll be able to do some amount of it in person, but we'll have to just see how that unfolds. I'm very hopeful. I hope you're hopeful too. So please have a great summer. And in any case, in person, online, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks ever so much. Take care. <laughs>